So how do we use the Lagrangian to find the minimum cost for a firm to produce a unit or a certain quantity? Okay. Well, let's think about we need two we have two functions, okay? Our cost is given by the price of our inputs that we choose to purchase. Let's start with the assumption that we're buying capital and labor. So that means the cost the firm faces to produce is the amount of labor they hire times the wage rate plus the amount of capital they hire times R. Okay, And to figure out the quantity that they're going to end up producing, we use the production function. The quantity is some product function of Q, I'm um, sorry, of K and L that they choose to hire. So this is the thing we're minimizing. Okay, and this is the constraint we need to hit because we need to produce at least Q, and this tells us how much capital and labor you need, all the different combinations to get Q. So if we're going to set up a Lagrangian, we first need our objective function, and that's the thing we're trying to minimize. Remember, the step one of a Lagrangian is set it up correctly. If you do it incorrectly, you're in trouble. So are we trying to maximize this? No, we're not trying to maximize output, we're trying to minimize cost. So this is our first step. Okay. Next we add in a constraint and it's sort of the convention to use just a different Greek letter for firms than for people, but it, that doesn't matter. You could use the lambda here that we used for consumers, it wouldn't matter. And the constraint is that we have to produce at least this. Remember the constraint is that uh, you know, we want this thing to be equal to this other thing. So let's write that as, I'm trying to find my cursor here, Q minus FKL. Okay? And that's our new Lagrangian that we use to minimize the cost of producing Q. Okay? After that, we follow the same steps to solve a Lagrangian. We first take the first order conditions for all choice variables plus the Lagrange multiplier. And in this case, our choices are K, L, and then the Lagrange multiplier is that little mu. So we would have something like derivative with respect to L. The derivative of the cost function part of that is just W. And then plus mu times q, there's no nothing in there, no l's that we see, minus the de partial derivative of this with respect to l. The next one is going to be with respect to k. It's the same, except we have an r. And we have the partial derivative with respect to capital. And then we have to do that Lagrange multiplier too. And that one's easy because there's no exponent or anything funny about that. It's just multiplied by this term here. All right. Now we go to step three, which is set the first order conditions equal to zero. Same as before. And then we go to step four, solve the system. So remember when we solve the system, we're going to end up with uh, L, that was one of our choice variables, and it's going to be a function of the exogenous variables that we didn't choose. We didn't choose the wage rate and we didn't choose R, and those are going to be our exogenous variables. We're going to end up with another function for the demand for capital, and that's going to be a function of the same two exogenous variables. And then technically we also end up with a function for the Lagrange multiplier, a function of these guys too. Okay, but we don't really we don't really need this guy in the same way that we need the others. Remember the Lagrange multiplier has an interpretation as sort of how important the how binding the constraint is, but we don't typically use it in the same way. Like it doesn't tell us something that we observe in the real world. Now, normally for solving the consumer's problem about how much to consume, we're done. But if we're trying to find the cost function, we have to add a fifth step here, which is to uh, use the results 
to plug the solutions back into our cost function. Okay, and what do I mean is, because remember the goal here is not to figure out how much capital and labor we want. The goal is to figure out what's the cost to produce Q. And the cost to produce Q, I'm sorry, there's another variable here, Q. That's really important. Q is another exogenous variable in this problem because it's something you don't choose. We're being told you need to find the cheapest way to produce, say, 10. Okay, so those are little Qs that I've added in at the end here. All right, so the cost function is going to be W times labor, but now we know exactly how much labor we should hire if we want the minimum cost, and it's given by this equation. And we have R times K, and again, we know exactly how much we should hire. And what we end up with is a function that looks, if we were to sort of write everything out, you know, it's going to depend on W, R, and Q. And this R is going to also depend on W, R, and Q. Okay? At the end of the day, we have a function that tells us, given the wage rate, given the amount of capital, and given the quantity that you want to hit, here's the cheapest way to do it. Okay? So next, now that we've sort of seen the framework, let's do an example to see how this all works, in the uh, how this actually plays out.